And we're live. Welcome to uh, this special giveth like interview with M Stable. This is actually a, a pretty cool thing. I, I've, never, I've never actually gotten to meet Dim Sum before. Dim Sum is uh, one of the major uh, components of making the M Stable DAO work. And uh, today we're going to talk about M Stable governance, uh, evolution of it, and how uh, you guys have, because you guys are innovating in the space of governance, uh, you know, actual DAO governance, not trying to just do 51% votes, but like actually bring uh, decentralized governance to the people in a way that can be easy and fun. And, uh, and you guys have an amazing story. But before that, I'm really curious to some something about your story. Like, how did you... How did you, maybe you can introduce yourself a little bit and tell us like how you got into crypto and found your way to Mstable. Yeah. So yeah, I'm Dimsum, um, or you can call me Dimitri. That's my real name. Um, I got into crypto basically a long time ago, but uh, when I just got into crypto, it was pretty much uh, like nothing was happening crypto too much. Like assets just went up, went down. And that was the only thing that was interesting about crypto, right? Um, there were no big apps on Ethereum. So it was a bit boring, actually. Um, what year was that? I think it was 2016, 17, something like that. I, th there was not much going on. So I didn't stick around for a long time, just had a few assets, and that was pretty much it. Then just before DeFi started, I got like re-interested in DeFi just because I was living abroad. I was not living in my home country. And I didn't feel comfortable holding assets, my assets in that country. Like I didn't want to save there. So that's how I started like buying Ethereum, buying Bitcoin. And then DeFi happened. And it's like, whoa, suddenly there's like so much stuff to do. Um, suddenly I don't have to go to a bank in order to invest. I can just go to Ethereum. And actually I had some problems getting banking as well uh, in that place abroad that I was living. So that felt like very natural to me to just get into this DeFi ecosystem because I don't want to ask permission whether, hey, can I please give you my money in order to invest? It's like, no, I just do it. So that's how I pretty much got into DeFi a bit more. And as I got into DeFi, I also got like closer to the communities. Um, I didn't want just to look at DeFi. I also wanted to like be in DeFi. So I got interested in participating in multiple communities, but most notably was Mstable. So I got pretty active in the Mstable uh, Discord. Um, th the first thing that I then did is just write a proposal. I was like, hey, I want Dai to be back in the basket because Dai was removed at some point from the basket. And I thought, hey, now is a good time to move it actually back. So I and wrote this. When, like, Dai was slightly above the peg. Yeah. And so people were draining it out of the basket. Yeah, exactly. Because the, the design of MUSD in the past was it was always guaranteeing you giving you one to one, right? So that had the effect that DAI just got drained because it was trading slightly above PEG. And with the M stable MUSD V2, it was an AMM. So it was like better pricing that way. So there wasn't the possibility of draining an asset. But I didn't know that that was planned. So I did, still suggested that. And they just messaged me in Discord saying, hey, we really like your proposal. Uh, actually, we're already working on that. Thanks for your proposal. I'm like, oh, damn. Um, yeah. I wrote something, but uh, didn't didn't result in anything. But because of that, I then got asked by one of the team members if I wanted to do a little bit more governance at Mstable. So um, my role was then officially called the protocol DAO cat herder. Right? So we have two DAOs, Treasury DAO, which is responsible for managing Treasury, and Protocol DAO, which is responsible to manage the protocol itself, like upgrades, smart contracts, uh, deployments, and also like adjusting of variables. So yeah, people don't understand how important that role is. Let me just say, like, cat herding in a DAO is so yeah. critical. Like, DAOs don't work without, like, it's an attention economy in some way and you need someone to be there and be like, yo, actually you need to pay attention to this, you know, and then enough time you start to trust the cat herders and there's some incredible cat herders in the space. Like I, every DAO has one. I know Yaler, uh, an old friend of mine does it for like four DAOs uh, and in give it, it's like Mitch and Lauren, you know, and, and every DAO, every DAO has their cat herders. So, uh, and it, you think that these DAOs are just autonomous happening on themselves, but people like you are really making it work. Yeah, especially when whenever I ask, hey, please sign this transaction. Hey, please sign again. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. 
That's guy. That's and, crucial. And so then you just kind of, I mean, I love this story of like an actual community member who just makes a proposal and then all of a sudden you just fall down the slippery slope into, uh, you know, Dow, Dow employment effectively, right? Like yeah. now are you like fully a member of the M stable team and, and part of this part of making it work? Yeah. I mean, I, I got hired by the Dow at some point then for a part-time role because initially it was just two hours per day, but I just put in more hours and then it's morphed to a full-time role. So now I'm pretty much, yeah, full-time employed by Mstable, by the protocol DAO, by the Mstable DAO. Oh, so many people are jealous, man. So many people want to just work for the DAOs, but that's the way, right? You just start making yourself useful and then, then they can't, they can't yeah, not true. hire you. Yeah. Uh, one one funny thing is as well is I tried to apply with my CV to multiple companies. I mean, I sent it to one, two or three, um, never heard back. <laughs> so, I mean, for some people, CV really works well, right? Because they have like maybe really reputable companies. Um, for me, community route works better just because I was really engaged in it and I could really show that I can add value. So I guess that was a better way for me. Absolutely. Uh yeah, and and then maybe not everyone knows exactly what M Stable is all about. What what's the mission of M Stable, and like uh, what are you guys doing? Right. So M Stable is a um, stable asset ecosystem, pretty much. So most notably, we have our M assets, which are meta assets. So meta assets supposed to solve a few issues with DeFi. Um, there's the fragmentation of stable coins. There are so many stable coins out there, right? So for the end user, it's kind of like a bit complicated to choose. Um, do I want to hold USDC or USDT? I don't know, right? So an M asset pretty much solves this problem by combining the most um, traded assets to one MUSD asset. While this MUSD is minted from the other assets, this MUSD itself functions as an AMM as well. So anybody who holds DAI can also use that basket of assets to swap into USDC. And then on top of it, those assets that are in, within the basket are actually deposited into Aave and Compound to earn an interest. So if you have MUSD minted from, let's say, DAI or USDC or a combination of those, you can then deposit that MUSD that you minted to save and earn like a really nice interest rate on your stable coins, which is above average for most assets. Uh, like if you compare Yearn or Idle or what are the others? Um, yeah. We have also MBTC, which solves a similar problem, but I noticed that MUSD or in general USD stable coins are much more popular. Like Bitcoin was at some point booming on in DeFi, but since then tapered kind of off. And I feel people are wanting to hold either volatile assets like Ethereum on Ethereum, or if they want to ha have a somewhat of a safe harbor, then it's usually like a USD stable coin. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's super cool. So the, what, what kind of percentages are people usually getting with uh, when they save their MUSD? Um, it can vary from, let's say, 8 10% uh, on wow. the low end up to sometimes 15 to 20%. Um, it really depends on the other wow. interest rate, on the compound interest rate as well, because it's a combination of both. Um, also, the, there is the platform rewards that we um, fund back to the users. So we get staked Aave, liquidated, and top up the interest rate from that. Plus, there are the AMM swap fees that gets also to the user. Wow. 8 to eight to 20% is a really, that's a nice return on stable points. That's super cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So, so let's get to the meat of it though. Like I'm really excited to just talk about the history of governance of Mstable because it's gone through some really cool, innovative uh, changes. And uh, when it started, it was about locking your tokens for a period of time and and well, but actually, honestly, I'm probably not nearly as good at explaining it as you. So maybe you could explain V1 governance and uh, and the pros and cons of it. Yeah. So V1 governance was pretty much tied to staking V1. That was our old staking contract. And that was really inspired a little bit or 
really inspired by the curve to token or the curve staking. So you took your MTA and you locked it for a specific period of time that you defined, and then you got your voting MTA, so the MTA pretty much. Um, the longer you lock it, the higher your voting power is. And then over time, it uh, tapers off until it hits like zero when the unlock happens again. And then you either need to restake before or increase your lock again in order to get back to that high locking rate. So that was V1 pretty much. And, um, and so, so with V1, there was some, I mean, there's some details I'd really be curious to get into because like there is like the latest lockup or the how much the leftover lockup and then there's the uh which which defined how much governance power you got but then there was the last lockup or the the latest lockup which defined how much rewards you got at a quadratic rate or something crazy like that i don't know do you do you remember these details yeah it, it was really from a user experience like not ideal just because we had uh voting power and earning power at some point, we also just decided they are equal the same. Otherwise, it was just too confusing uh, for any end user to kind of realize how much they actually staked and how what's the basis for the calculation on how much they earned or how much they voted, right? But in a sense, like your voting power was equal to earning power then because it just tapered off over time until the lock expired. And then you could just unlock everything back. Um, we didn't do it though, like curve, like in curve, you can lock up to four years. Like it wasn't like this. So you maximally could lock until a specific period of time. Like there was like one timestamp that was the maximum defined lock. We could of course move it ahead, but at some point we also decided there are some not issues, but it wasn't the most user-friendly and it had some problems as well, um, at least for M stable, like as we function, it was not the most ideal like curve token uh, curve um, staking contract works really well for curve because it's really good for the ecosystem it involved around it but for us um, we saw a little bit different route after a while so the biggest issues with v1 weren't they weren't necessarily structural it was more user experience it was like it was just confusing to work with and i mean did anyone have any problems with v1 governance uh, that that are worth noting yeah, I mean, it was because because the voting power um, tapered off over time, like users constantly needed to increase their lock time in order to get the maximum amount of voting power, right? And that's when the gas price was still cheap, right? That's when we initiated that idea. But then gas price got expensive, so locking your... Uh, voting, like locking your MTA or increasing lock time again and again and again, it's kind of getting expensive, right? So we didn't think that this was the best way anymore, just because you wanted to give the user a way to stake and then just be part of it without like re-initializing the same transaction over and over again. Mainnet gas fees have ruined governance for so many things. Yeah, <laughs> so true. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, that's that's cool. And then, uh, where the so when you guys were analyzing V1 governance, you're like, okay, we need to remove the lockup time completely. Like, what did what did you decide were the problems uh, with V1 governance that you wanted to solve? And then, how did V2 governance address them? Yeah, so that was I think the biggest issue. Um, that was also because of like, we have a boost for rewards. So the more you stake, the higher you boost to get after a while for particular pools. And the boost also deteriorated after a while, like the longer you stake, um, your boost is pretty high in the beginning, but then it got down, down, down. And you just were like, where's my boost gone? Why is it gone? So all these things kind of led to the idea that we want to move away and um, not hundred percent from the voting escrow curve uh, model, but a bit more in a hybrid model. So we seek um, to ins get inspired a bit more by the staked Aave um, model while taking everything that we like about the curve model as well. So it's kind of like a hybrid that we then settled upon. Um, so now how it works is you don't have to choose a time upfront. You just stake your tokens and then they are locked. 
right? But because that's the case now that you stake for a, your tokens and they're not locked anymore, um, there was of course the problem that users can just withdraw at any time, right? Because then the governments can just directly be drained and people can just withdraw all of their money uh, of the MTA. So that's why we have also like a similar model what Aave does, like a, um, like a cool down window. So when you want to initiate a withdrawal, you need to initiate a cool down first of three weeks. And then after three weeks expires, you can then withdraw your tokens back. That was necessary because our MTA was then, once it's in a staking contract, is supposed to also secure um, the basket itself against the pegging. Right? It's not active yet, but that was the initial idea that we don't want the user, once that event happens, to easily just withdraw their money and then just get like circumvent that whole system. So that's why we needed some kind of locking mechanism. So, so sort of like how MakerDAO's the MKR token is the collateral to hold the system accountable to working. Uh, MTA does the same service in yours. Yeah. Tokens are locked, so they have to be locked. Although, and if people could just withdraw them, then it's not serving the function. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so in V2, there's a three-week cooldown to unlock, and then there's also a fee, right? Yeah, there is a fee, um, especially if you want to withdraw like after three weeks already or after one month. There is a fee, but it decreases quite fast. It tapers off, and then after 48 weeks like less than a year, it's it's pretty much zero. And is the fee in MTA or is it in uh, a stable token, like M, M stable? <laughs> no, no. When and you US stake your MTA and you want to withdraw prematurely, um, you just get less MTA back in that case. Okay. But of course, you as you stake, you earn also MTA. So that might compensate you a little bit better. Ah, okay. And then with the voting power and the rewards, uh, I, now you're saying that they are the exact same system, like you get the same amount of rewards as you get voting power? Uh, is that, yeah, is that I mean, it's, it's almost like that. Like in the beginning, if you stake 100 MTA, you get 100 staked MTA, which is also representative of your voting power. But that doesn't stay the same. So you could actually increase your voting power and that's by no means of monetary incentive, like monetarily way, like you don't have to pay that. So we have quests. I think quests are super interesting just because we wanted also to reward users that are active or that use the protocol actively, but don't necessarily uh, want or have the big bag that they want to have, right? Like they just don't have the assets. So uh, with the quests, we want to give these users a bigger voice. So one of the quests is, for example, um, just the amount of time you stake. So the longer you stake, the higher your multiplier becomes, the time multiplier. So first, it's just one. Then after 12 weeks, or don't quote me exactly on how many weeks, it's 1.2. So your uh, voting power is actually increased by 1.2. Right, just because you staked a longer amount means you earned a higher or a, a, a more substantial voice for votes. And is that a gradual thing, or is that like a you hit a plateau and then oh no, nope, go up to this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty much like a step, step, step by step. So okay. one point two, one point four, one point six, and then I think the highest is one point eight. And is that is that like a, was that a decision made because of the way solidity works and just like curves are hard to do, or was that something that uh, you guys just wanted to make it for UX? Yeah, um, it was. It yeah, not hundred percent sure. I think it was mostly done because um, we didn't want to have like the amount continuously increasing that would kind of break composability with my, with the other quests where you get actually the real multiplier as well awarded. And also um, I think it would be quite problematic to have this in increase gradually over time um, because at some point it needs to temper off. And also we didn't want to like rewrite all the time um, in the data as well on the blockchain. So it's, 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 it's a like step-by-step -step increase. Nice, nice. And and these quests are super cool. So, uh, I mean, I just love this idea of 
token economies being economic games of sorts, you know, and you get power, you get money, you get you get fame uh, if you succeed in the game. And you, then we give you tokens and those tokens have these powers, you know, and I, I, uh, I was looking at quests and they look pretty fun uh, and you guys made it really fun. So, uh, you made it like a game. And so yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe you could talk more about quests and especially like how they actually work in the math with rewards versus voting power and all of that. Yeah. So apart from the time multiplier, we have also other quests, um, which are quests that require some kind of action. Like the, the first quest that we started with was the Great Migration. And that gives you a multi multiplier of 1.25. Just because when we just migrated from staking v1 to staking v2, we wanted to give the users that staked or that withdrew from v1 and stayed within a specific period of time in v2, so kind of migrated, we want to give them like a reward because they've been along for this long ride with us all the way until staking v1 ended. And then they decided to continue to stake with us on in v2. So that's why we give them a permanent multiplier of 1.25. So if you stake within that time window, you got a multiplier of 1.25 that permanently increases your voting power and your earning potential as well. So that was a cool quest. Then we have a yeah. Metanaut space program quest, which is just a bunch of random actions, uh, have a certain amount of pull apps, uh, vote in the emissions controller, uh, which we can also get later on to what the emissions controller actually is. So that gives you also a seasonal multiplier. Seasonal multiplier just expires after nine months. So then we have to come up with something new, interesting to do for the users. Wow, so that, that's super cool. And and you were saying that the, the rewards and the voting power are multiplied by the quests. Exactly. So you stake 100 MTA, for example, um, you get a multiplier that staked MTA increases. So your balance of staked MTA actually increases on chain, but the underlying, of course, stays the same. And based on that staked MTA, the increased one with the multiplier, um, that's how your voting power is calculated. And that's also the basis for the calculation of the rewards. Okay, so the rewards and the voting power are calculated a little bit differently, but the base like thing is the same. So people, so the users are like, oh yes, I have this score, like an MTA score of sorts, um, a multiplier that goes with their, their funds. And then, oh yeah, here's the reward calculation and here's the voting power calculation. Is that true? Well, we use mostly snapshots. So your staked MTA balance, which is the one that you get after all multipliers are applied, um, that's your voting power. But that's also the basis for the calculation of your earning. So how much you get of the MTA that is um, rewarded in the staking contract, that's also based upon the staked MTA. Ah, okay. So it's more of like a, a series thing. It's like, okay, you stake, you have multipliers, that's your voting power. And then yeah. the rewards are based off of your voting power. Yeah, yeah. Ah, exactly. okay. Ah, oh, that yeah. I, I can see how that is much cleaner for the user, right? Instead yeah. of this kind of like, ah, oh, I have this, so I get this, and they have to too many numbers in their head at once. Yeah. Uh, that makes a lot of sense, and I, I think that we don't give enough appreciation to how complicated these systems are that we're building. So it's nice to see uh, it get a little cleaner. So, okay, so then what is this emission control that you're talking about? How does that work? Yeah, so I've been involved in governance like since I started. And whenever we wanted to adjust something about the emissions, I needed to write a proposal or somebody in the team needed to write a proposal. It needs to be posted uh, in the forum. It needs to be voted upon. So that was like always two to three weeks that just needed to happen for governance, right? But what if I want to move the incentives from one pool to another pool, just because I personally feel that this pool should get more MTA or that this pool actually adds more value for M-stable in general, right? I would need to write a proposal three weeks and then it maybe happens or not. Um, so that's why we introduced like the emissions controller. The, the emissions controller um, has a couple of functions. Like, the, the, the one that, that's very important to us was that we wanted to lock in a six-year emission schedule of MTA, right? That's locked in on chain. 
So everybody that has MTA or thinks about having MTA can just have certainty about how much MTA that will be uh, emitted at what point. So that was the one purpose. The other purpose is also to just be we, much more we, nimble. Can, Sorry. Can we get that for other central banks? That would be so cool. Like, you know, <laughs> stable emission, predictable emission. Instead yeah. of just like waiting for the Federal Reserve to see what they're going to say. Are they going to keep buying assets? What are they going to do? Uh, okay, sorry. So th that's really cool. And also, I, I couldn't agree more with the proposals, like oh, writing a proposal and then pass a proposal on voting. Like that's the that's the old world way of Dow governance, of governance in general, right? And uh, I'm so I'm super, I'm really excited to hear how you stepped away from the proposals and are doing this emission control. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no worries. I mean, proposals are not completely off the table, but it's just like for these repetitive proposals that we want to have a system in place that gives uh, more power or even to token voters. Um, because with the proposal, somebody writes a proposal and then everybody can vote. But with the emissions controller, then we give direct influence, like the, the staked, uh, yeah, the users that staked MTA have direct influence on where we will, we need to emit the MTA. So in the emissions control, you can directly, based on your voting power again, um, that you get after multiplying the time multiplier and the quest multiplier, you can say, I want 100% of my voting power. Um, I want to vote on this dial or on this pool. And then it gets calculated. And then once per week, based on everybody's vote, uh, the emissions got calculated based on how much the top line emission we locked in and then how much partially it needs to stream to what pool. That's cool. So there's like a regular time every week, Fridays at noon, or, or what time is it? Do you know? Thursday, usually. Thursday. Thursday, UTC something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. So like on Thursday at this time, there is like a snapshot taken of where everyone's tokens are basically. And then that's the week's distribution for each pool. Exactly, exactly. And the cool thing about the emissions controller is also that once you voted on your preferred distribution, you don't need to vote again and again and again. It's like you voted and that's going to be your, well, your vote until you want to change it, of course, again. So that makes it also like a lot more gas efficient for users because they don't have to continuously uh, do transactions. And for us is we can now automate the process of just knowing where these incentives need to go. So we don't have to write the proposals. We just take whatever's on chain and we execute upon that. There are smart contract behind it. So it literally gets from one smart contract to the next smart contract that notifies the third smart contract. And then the, uh, the emissions are pretty much in the vault that gets them streamed to users. Oh, that's so cool. So, and it, it's great because then the users have regular feedback into the system, you know, instead of having to wait every four years to vote, you know, uh, or every November they vote on all the proposals at once. They have like regular feedback at any, at any moment, you know, they can, uh, they can have a say. That's yeah. super cool. And, and is there anything interesting with the math around that? Like, do you do any kind of square rooting behind uh you know people that are staked because it sounds like with quests you have in some way almost an identity issue or opportunity depending on how you look at it like mm. uh that like i mean is it hard for one user to have multiple addresses or is it do you give any extra like special power to an address that has, that has done a lot of these quests and then Maybe their power is square rooted or or anything like that. No, we don't tamper thus this way, just because I don't think there's any incentives for users to split up their wallets too much. It's actually more beneficial for them to consolidate it into one because yeah. then the chance that they actually achieve those quests is higher. So we don't slash any voting power or anything like that. And the only thing that happens though is if you consider to stake more after a while just because your time multiplier will suddenly apply to the newly staked MTA as well. So that's why we calculate the weighted timestamp in order to adjust this time stamp based on how much you, re you increase your stake with a little bit back so it doesn't get 
like the highest multiplier just upon staking because otherwise it will be easy exploitable by staking yeah. one MTA, leaving it there for a couple of years, right? And then staking 5 million MTA and have suddenly the highest multiplier. So we kind of needed to account for this uh, possibility. Ah, oh, that's really cool. And you know, one of the one of the things with V1 uh, that I liked is this idea that your voting power decreases uh, the closer you get to being able to unlock your tokens, right? And it seems like in V2, that's completely opposite. I mean, your your voting power actually increases the longer you have staked your tokens. So it's like you're instead of I don't know if it's like punishment versus reward, but it, it's like, uh, you know, it's, it ends up being a little bit more trust to the user. It's like, okay, you've been here a long time. We trust you with more voting power versus yeah. before it's like, okay, you're soon, you're able to withdraw. So we're going to give you less voting power. Can you make comments on that, on that decision? Like, was that, uh, was that really informed by the users or is that, yeah. Yeah, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting way to put it. And I mean, that's totally on point, right? Rather than um, getting the stick outs and punishing the ones that are close to the unlock, we wanted to give the carrots uh, to users that don't uh, consider leaving. So I think that was like a really, uh, like a really um, big decision or like a good decision, not, not proposed by me, but within the team that we want users to have a good incentive to continue to stake rather than the, the time expires and they need to do every time on-chain a transaction to increase the time. Just because um, from, from a user, pers- user experience perspective as well, um, in order to do the, the, the best thing for the protocol or for the DAO in general, they needed to do an extra action every time, right? So we wanted to move that p- friction part so in order to do the best for the protocol or for the DAO or for himself, we want to remove that one action. So it's kind of, it's already the best by default. And then only if you want to uh, withdraw your tokens, then you need to do the additional action. So I think mm-hmm. it was important to move away the perspective. Yeah. And I mean, is there a fear that, oh my gosh, they could vote for something bad and then leave um, and sell their tokens? Uh, this, this is this is the normal explanation for why you wouldn't go that route, right? Oh, because you want the, the people with skin in the game, you know, they, they have more skin in the game. So, uh, you know, they could, you know, they could go rogue and, and decide that they're actually big fans of some other protocol and they just, you know, dump and make some bad voting decisions and then dump all their MTA before uh, before the, the voting decisions come in. But I guess that's the cool down period. Inside. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's a cool down period. And that's also why we have withdrawal fees. So if you really just want to uh, influence the protocol in a bad way, then you would also lose uh, at the beginning around six or 7% of your MTA. So if it's that much worth to you, then please go ahead and like, you can do that, right? But then also know that it has a cost attached to it. Mm-hmm. Right. And during that cooldown period as well, you don't make any additional MTA as well. That's like the MTA doesn't earn anything while you sit in cooldown. Mm. Okay, cool. So yeah, it's like general users are trusted. And you know, if they're just playing the game, then like they they win when they play the way they would want to play. And yeah, yeah. Uh, but then you have protections against the like. Oh, you know, I don't know. I feel like, I feel like we're too often considering like, oh, what if people do this or that, you know, it's such an adversarial environment that sometimes it come, becomes like, I just want to help. And it feels like you're fighting. And I, I like that you guys have evolved past that. I think that's, yeah. so, I mean, is there anything else about V2 that's really, that's pretty interesting that you'd want to bring up? Yeah. I mean, another big thing is actually delegation. Like, mm-hmm. um, I'm not even sure that's part of Curve or Aave. I'm not 100% sure. But we also, like as a cat herder, um, we noticed like um, that's the participation in votes dropped off. Like the first few votes got a lot of traction. People wanted to be super active. But over time, it kind of trickles down. And then it 
gets to the users that actually want to be involved in the protocol, are actually looking to influence or participate. And also, of course, like the core team members that are also voters, just like anybody else, right? So the participation rate was low. The voted the MTA that voted was also quite low, like from the total staked amount. So that's why we also uh, enabled delegation. So anybody who delegates, they get the choice of picking somebody to delegate to. That can be a trusted community member, that can be a core team member, or like any other address. So that kind of moves again a little bit away from raw money, like how much you actually have in assets and how much MDA you just bought yourself, and way to a bit more reputation game as well, right? Because now suddenly, uh, if you're a community member that's quite active and you show yourself there, you have the chance to get somebody to delegate to you, right? And therefore increasing the level of uh, responsibility of trust in you as well. And also like you have a bigger say in the protocol. And um, one thing that I want to mention is that we didn't want to um, give users or punish users that don't vote as well, right? Because every user that stakes MTA is slightly different. And there are good reasons to just stake MTA and benefit from the upside, but not maybe be um, yeah, involved in day-to-day -day voting, right? And for those users, well, we give the option to delegate to somebody and they can also earn the same quest multiplier pretty much from like the actions, the governance action translate to um, the person that delegated as well. Wait, so, oh, so the person who delegated gets a piece of the multiplier of the person they delegate to. Yeah, I mean, there are some quests that are just governance related, right? Voting on the dials is an action in the Metanaut, Metanaut space program, or there's another quest um, that requires to vote on 80% of the proposals, but it's going to be awarded in the next season. That's not possible if you delegate, right? So for these kind of actions and quests, you can still earn them if you delegate it to somebody that actually did those things. Ah, cool. So if your address is used to vote even through delegation, then you pass some of these quests. Yeah. That's super cool. Ah, that's really interesting. It's a great way to incentivize delegation because, you know, not everyone wants to play the Dow politics game, right? It's like- Exactly. Uh, Allegation and da da da, oh, whatever. You know, I just came here to stakes, make some yield. The degen, yeah. apes, you know, they just, they just, but then uh, I love this idea of turning degen apes into like giving them a reason to care, you know, uh, giving them a quest saying, no, look, you'll, you, your degen will pay off more if you actually participate. And so, oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I like that. That's a great incentive solution for a delegation. And and then the culture around uh, Dow politics, you know, like the, how do you guys manage who, how people, users can find out who to delegate to? And like, did you get, you know, I saw ENS and Gitcoin and I'm a Gitcoin delegate and an ENS delegate, right? I, I played the games and proposed on the forums and stuff like that. Is that how you guys do it as well? Or how did you end up uh, like getting delegates well known? Yeah. When we just launched Staking V2, it was just after Gitcoin launched. So Gitcoin did like a like like such a nice launch. Like seriously, that was like this one, two, three steps. You know, first learn about the protocol, then choose your delegate. It was super nice. So that was a little bit influenced by that, but we didn't chose um, anything um, to sway the user too much in the front end. Um, what we did though is we just ask openly in the forum. Um, everybody that wants to become an official delegatee, which means you would just get your own profile picture, you would get a description, um, and yeah, your ENS also attached to it. You can just submit your profile here, and then you will just get added to um, the, the file that gets ultimately uploaded to IPFS. So that's how there is a, already a list um, of users that have already submitted that. And then, of course, we have like a ranking list. So there you can see directly when you want to delegate to someone, actually the distribution. So who gets how much voting power? Um, so based on that, on those two factors, you can make a good decision already. But of course, that's not perfect. Um, so the other thing is, of course, like just reputation. So if you 
if you're a user that has a lot of questions in the uh, in, in the Discord or in the forum, right? Usually people, somebody will help you. So that builds a little bit of reputation. Um, somebody who is active on Twitter or I don't know, um, yeah, kind of helps the protocol to succeed. I mean, that person gets also better notice and therefore might receive more delegation as well. So I think despite the that we are only having our public addresses and being like completely detached maybe from the person. I think it's important that in governance, we still have some kind of uh, persona attached to who wants to influence uh, a protocol. So you're saying in the UI, you don't show people's profile pictures or anything. You just show, you just say, hey, put the address that you want in, or do they even click the address? I mean, you can directly just input any address, but as I said, we opened it up to everyone to submit their profile, and then that profile then also shows up in the UI. Okay. So, so there, there is like a profile picture, picture with a you know, name attached to it, and then there's a small description if you click on it as well. But that's like that's it. Ah, very cool, very cool. And do you think the response to delegation has been pretty strong? Like, like a lot of people delegate. Yeah. I mean, I think it's actually like probably the best thing that we did, to be honest. I mean, apart from Quest, which is also quite amazing. But yeah. I can see that the amount of MTA that the votes now is substantially higher than what we had before, right? Because of course, the, 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 the addresses that are more active in voting get a higher share because they are probably the ones that are get delegated to. Um, also, personally, I surprisingly received quite a bit of delegation which i didn't expect at all I mean, but then Santa, dude of course yeah i know but then i got quite a, quite 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 a strong voice suddenly in a protocol that six months before or like nine months before i was only a community member so i think that's a kind of fascinating thing and i'm i'm really humbled and surprised by um that's that that i have like almost nine percent i guess or like a really insane amount of voting power and that makes me also more responsible in my decisions. And I feel like I also consider the wider uh, influence of what that decision might be for the, the whole protocol and for the users itself. So yeah, a lot no, of responsibility I, as well. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more that delegation, uh, like, cause I'm a Gitcoin delegate, right? One of the top nice. Gitcoin delegates. So like when I have to vote on something, I'm like, oh crap, there's a lot of people that, you know, care, it matters so much more. I'm going to vote on all of them because I have all this power. And I'm also going to research the vote and understand a little bit more of the details besides just reading the title. Whereas maybe I probably wouldn't vote. I mean, come on, we're all busy in crypto, you know? Like I don't work for Gitcoin. Why would I vote? Yeah. So I, but now I'm a delegate, I have to, I have no choice. I have to start paying attention. So uh, yeah, I think, uh, I'm really glad that you brought up delegation. It's not actually a, even a feature I knew existed in MTA. Nice. So, so that's super cool. That's really cool. Uh, is there any other features in V2 that you think are, are worth noting that haven't been brought up? No, I think that's all. Yeah. Is, so then I guess that begs the question, when V3? Are you guys going to... Uh, <laughs> Are you guys going to upgrade again? Is there anything that you're like looking at that's you're like, you know what, this could be a little bit better or when we save that for a V3, it's on GitHub somewhere. <laughs> I mean, I think we reached a point where staking works as intended and as we wanted to work. And now it's as extensible for all the future use cases to just keep continue to expanding it. So um, we have like a hybrid system again um, with the emissions controller being on chain, but then we have governance, like anything that is other than that proposals still go uh, off chain, right? We have snapshots, uh, votes as well still, um, which is just really good for the user because they don't need to expand gas just to vote on things. So I think as we expand that and as we also enter in the multi-chain world, I think the governance is as extensible that we need, we can just expand it. And the question will be probably if there is something that the government that the staking v2 cannot do, then we might think about a v3. But I think the design of the v2 is in a sense 
um, locked in, especially with the emissions locked in for the next six years. Just we're just gonna stick with that. Man, you've just brought up a couple of questions. Uh, I, so like snapshot, great, great point. So you guys are using snapshot as well. And, and how do you, um, how do what kind of strategy do you do? Do you use the quest multiplier in for snapshot? And do you, uh, do you uh, include, yeah, I mean, I guess you include MTA on other chains and like, how do you, how do you set up your snap, snapshot? Yeah, so our voting strategy is just ERC20 uh, balance. And um, so we literally take the staked MTA balance that is after all the multipliers get applied to that. And then that you becomes your voting power as well. So it's like, I think it's a good thing that the voting power is across multiple places the same. So we don't have different calculations there. And that's pretty much how many votes you get as well uh, in snapshot. We so if currently you have, have MTA, if you have loose MTA, you still get a vote. You get one vote. But if you have staked MTA, you just get the multiplier of that. No, no, no. You need to stake in order to have a vote. So okay. anything that is staked can have a vote. But then, of course, if you have your multipliers, then you get a higher voting power as well. And you, because you ask also about multi-chain, um, like currently we are also deployed on Polygon. MTA is on Polygon, but there's no staking on Polygon. So a user would actually need to bridge it back to mainnet and then uh, stake it there in order to participate in governance as well. Any thoughts on moving the staking operation to Polygon as well? I think it would be quite interesting to explore that, but in a sense, it wouldn't be the current design of staking v2. It has to be like a, a system built on top of it. Right, that's what I mean. It's like it's, it's it's extensible. So what we can think about, and that's just my thoughts. That's not what Mstable does. But what we can think about is having a wrapper contract that just represents the staked amount, and then bridge that to uh, another layer and allow uh, on Polygon, for example, uh, users to swap that representation of the staked asset with the MTA that they have, so they can just uh, swap in and out when they want to. Um, which also has That's like a cool. bit of implications about um, the kind of cooldown problematic that suddenly you can just like exit entry position. So I think as we enter a multi-chain world, I think these going to be like really interesting questions that we don't have a solution yet, but we're thinking about it, of course. Yeah, ah, that's super cool. That's super cool. Yeah, because of course, vesting and staking doesn't really work if you can just trade that vesting if that's a token right yeah, uh, yeah, yeah so wow that's super cool man well uh we're we're basically at the top of the hour i feel like we got like deep into the the weeds with m stable governments and it was very enlightening uh do, do you have any final words about about m stable that you want to leave off and of course how do people follow you and, and this sort of thing yeah i think one interesting thing is actually that we're working on m stable v2 um so we're working towards something um, that we learned during our current products that where we should take it further. So I think there will be quite, quite an interesting uh, yeah, roadmap announcement in the next few weeks, just because oh, we kind of shift direction a little you bit. Tease. Because we noticed we get a lot more traction in that way. So if you get traction one way, you kind of want to move that way better. So I think that will be super super interesting um to see what we come up with so an announcement of an announcement coming up <laughs> yeah i know i feel so bad but i i cannot announce it myself it's just something that i can say that we are about to announce <laughs> that was really amazing to dive in dude where where can people learn more i mean you can go to mstable.org just to see there or app uh, mstable.app is our application actually where you can deposit your assets and earn interest um, you can also go to our discord um, that's where we all mostly hang around and that's it yeah thank you so much man uh, it was really fun